A couple of weeks ago, I began this series by telling you the story of the Dust Bowl era farmers in the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas who uh, looked at their lives. They knew that what they ultimately wanted to see, but they had a decision to make. Uh, what they wanted to see was a crop come in. They wanted to see uh, a great harvest be reaped in their fields and their pastures, but they had a decision to make. Um, they, they were down to their last bit of wheat seed, and they had a decision to make whether they were going to keep that seed for themselves, to use it to feed their families, or whether they would sow it into their fields. Now, thankfully, many of these farmers chose to take what little they had left and to sow it into their fields, and they reaped an extraordinary harvest. The rains came that year, uh, the plants grew, and the harvest was bountiful for everyone who planted. So bountiful uh, was the harvest in that year that not only were they able to feed their families, they were able to save their farms and secure their future. And so if, if you could have asked any one of those farmers on the front end what they wanted, uh, they wanted a harvest they wanted to save their farms. They wanted their future to be secure. They wanted to see fruit born in, in their, their lives and in their fields and in their, their finances. All of these things, they wanted to see fruit born. But in order for that to happen, they first had to sow the seed that they already had. Now, throughout this series, what we are doing is we're pointing you to the investments, if you will, to the, the sowing that God has called us to. Uh, our mission as a church is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And the reason that we want to do that is we believe that the life that is most fully surrendered to Jesus, the fully devoted life of the disciple, is the richest, fullest, most abundant life you could ever live. And that in the midst of that life, God will take ordinary people like us People with a past, people with a story, people with weaknesses, people with a little bit of brokenness in their life. And he will use us to bring light in the midst of darkness, to not just reap a harvest in our lives, but also through us and in our community and in our family and in this world. And so we've been talking to you about the areas that you're investing in in your life, the places where you're sowing, where you're choosing to focus your time, your treasure, your, your talents, and your attention. Now, last week we told you the most important thing, the most important investment that you will ever make. That's in devoting yourselves daily to Jesus Christ. Jesus told us in John chapter 15. He said, I'm the vine and you're the branch. If you will abide in me and I in you, then your life will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And no matter how hard we try or work or you know, study or prepare, apart from Jesus Christ, there will be no spiritual, no lasting fruit that will be born both in or through our lives. But if we simply abide in him, we set aside time each day, devoting ourselves daily to Jesus Christ, spending time in his word and walking with him in prayer, trusting him to do in us and through us what he desires to accomplish. If we will just abide in him, devoting ourselves daily to him, he's going to bear much fruit in our life. And I said this, I said, the single most important gift, the greatest gift you could ever give to yourself or to your spouse or to your family or to anyone in this entire world is the time that you will choose to spend with Jesus Christ each and every day. And we just called you to invest there. Invest your life in seeking God's kingdom by devoting yourself daily to him. Now, the second thing today is may not sound all that appealing to you. As a matter of fact, it might feel a little bit dreary even or mundane, or, or you might ask yourself, how in the world could this bear fruit in my life? The, the second practice of a disciple that we, we called our church to, that we as members have covenanted together to pursue uh, with one another, uh, the first is devoting daily. The second is gathering consistently. It's, it's what you're doing right now, that you would make a commitment in your life that you are going to consistently gather with the local body of Jesus Christ. The, the, we, we gather on Sunday mornings. We worship together. We sit under the Word together. We celebrate communion and baptism together. That you would make this a consistent discipline in your life, that you would consistently sow this into your life, and I believe it's going to bear much fruit. When I was a kid, I thought that my grandfather was the greatest fisherman who ever lived. I remember walking into his house as a kid, and he had a trophy case full of fishing trophies. And of course, I mean, I was pretty impressed, and like big old tall trophies, and he'd won lots and lots of tournaments. And so I, I thought he was probably the greatest fisherman that I ever knew. 
And I remember one time I got a chance to go out fishing with he and my dad, and we we're on Worcester Lake, and we're in the boat, and uh, I'll be honest with y'all, it was a slow day. And I don't know how you, you know, if you've been with young kids, but young kids in slow days fishing, they don't go together all that well. Um, a few hundred times I'd cast out my lure and reeled it in, and we hadn't caught anything that day. Over and over and over and over, it seemed like, you know, the work I was doing wasn't really, it wasn't being very productive. I wasn't catching any fish. I was getting tired. I was ready to go home. But at some point in the day, I was probably staring off into the distance. My grandfather says to me, hey, Jason, uh, cast out between those two trees over there. Now, I'd already been hung up a few times, and, you know, you got to take the boat over there, and it's embarrassing, and I'm like, oh, great, cast between two trees. I'm not so good at this, but... Because my grandfather told me to do it, I did, and I cast out between these two trees. And just as I drag my lure uh, between the two trees, boom, you know, I, I get a bite and I, I reel the fish in, and I would tell you how big it was, but y'all wouldn't believe me if I did. But I ended up catching a, a pretty big fish uh, that day. It was the biggest fish that we caught in our boat on that particular day, and if I hadn't chosen to listen to the wisdom of my, my grandfather, I probably would have never made that cast. Because it seemed like over and over and over, I'd been casting and I'd been trying and it didn't seem like what I was doing was bearing much fruit. Um, today, the, the discipline we're going to talk to you about, the investment we're asking you to make, it may feel like that for you in your life. Like, I've been doing this for my whole life. I mean, I've been coming to church. I've been, you know, setting aside Sunday mornings. I've been co coming here for worship and I just don't see how it's bearing fruit in my life. Well, the number one reason why you should gather consistently with the local body of believers is because God himself has told us to. Um, God, who created all that we know and see, who knows you better than you know yourself, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who died on the cross that you might find true life, he has called us to this discipline. Now, I'm going to give you four things. That's the first one. I'm going to give you four reasons why you should gather consistently with the local body. But before we, we do that today, I, I, need to, I want to clarify some things for you. Um, many of us have been raised in a sort of legalistic kind of religion that said, hey, uh, if you're going to be right with God, uh, you got to show up a lot, right? you got to be here every time the doors are open. Uh, some of you have, have bragged to people in your life that, man, the first Sunday after I was born, I was in church, you know? like uh, we, we were kind of raised in an era where you would mark your faithfulness to Christ by your religious devotion. I actually have uh, a picture for you here to put on the screens. Um, I don't know if you were raised Baptist or not, but if you were, you might recognize this as a Baptist Sunday school attendance pin, right? Uh, you see third year, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year. Uh, that's like bra Baptist bragging rights on display. So what this was is if you went to Sunday school every single week uh, without ever missing, uh, the, the church would reward you. Now, just a little bit of description of this in award in particular. Um, Here's the description on the, the webpage. This is an exclusive Baptist Sunday School Attendance Award. It has a cross and a crown. A cross and a crown. And it has a wreath attached, and it is plated gold. Now, I think these awards are a terrible idea. I'm going to be honest with you. I think they're, I want people to gather and come to church. Uh, however, uh, I don't think it's the best idea to uh, reward the person who spread the flu to everyone who shows up on a Sunday morning. If you're sick, we don't want you to come. We love you. We have a live stream. You can watch online, suffer while you watch it because you have the flu or whatever. We don't want you to be here. Uh, when I first started in ministry, I worked at a church that gave me one week of vacation a year and... Uh, uh, wherever I went, my pastor expected me to bring back a bulletin from wherever I attended church because you could not miss church on a Sunday. So drive all night, better find a place in Pensacola to attend church or whatever. Um, I, I don't believe that's the case. I don't think that God's going to reward us better uh, if we made it all 52 Sundays in a year than the person who stayed home when they were ill or took a vacation with their family. Listen, I, I want people to be gone from this church when they need to be gone from this church. And yet what we're calling you to is a very consistent discipline in your life where you say, man, I, I'm going to take my calendar and I'm just going to mark Sunday morning off. 
Like that's going to be a time that is devoted to the Lord, where I'm going to gather with the body to worship and not just to show up to consume what's offered me on Sunday morning, but I'm going to get there early and I'm going to invest in the people around me. I'm going to seek to encourage. I'm going to seek to build up and I'm going to stay late and I'm going to help clean it. I'm going to be a part of the local body. Sunday is the day that I'm going to devote to the Lord. No matter what else is going on, I'm going to be there for worship. And we do this because God told us to. Now, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10 today, and the writer of Hebrews is writing to Hebrew people who, if you, if you remember, they practiced the Old Testament law. Now, in the Old Testament, there were certain feasts, there were certain festivals, certain sacrifices that they had to offer, and they were very serious. I mean, if you read the first five books of the Old Testament, you're going to see how serious God was about the feast, about the festivals, about the very specific sacrifices that they had to offer. Now, just prior to this section we're going to read in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews has been kind of reminding them about what they've been offering, about the Old Testament sacrificial system. And he's been bringing their attention to the fact that Jesus fulfilled all of that perfectly. That they didn't have to go and offer sacrifices day by day. They didn't have to observe the feasts or the festivals anymore. That Jesus had fulfilled all of those things perfectly. That no more was there a lawful, legalistic requirement for them to gather very specifically on these days and this often and in this way. But interestingly enough, the writer of Hebrews, while he says, hey, it's been fulfilled in Jesus... And you're no longer under the law. He's going to call them right back to gathering consistently with the body of Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. That's an interesting section. If you've read uh, much of Hebrews, you know it's very Jewish in nature. But here's what uh, the writer says in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 23. Again, we look, we fix our eyes on Jesus. He's fulfilled the law. But then in verse 23, he says, But let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works and not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, in the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament, um, those feasts were actually to commemorate the works of God on behalf of, of the nation of Israel. Uh, the Passover would commemorate the time that, that God delivered his people out of their slavery in Egypt. The festivals, the sacrifices, they were all to remind the people of how God had worked on their behalf. And even though they didn't have to observe the feasts or the sacrifices any longer, it was still important for the people of God to be reminded of the work of God on their behalf. And so as the writer here is calling them to remain steadfast and faithful, not to be, uh, to be, or to be unwavering in their faith, he's showing them the importance of consistently gathering together to be reminded of the work of God on their behalf. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get really caught up in the day-to-day -day of life. The situations and the circumstances, the goings-on, uh, there are days where I totally blow it and I find my sh myself uh, discouraged and ashamed. There are times where, man, it's hard for me to fix my eyes on Jesus. It's hard for me to see the goodness of God through the difficulty of my own circumstances. When we gather consistently, we show up here in this place to be reminded of the good news of Jesus Christ to be reminded of the gospel, to refocus on what Christ has called us to, of the riches that we have in him. Uh, we're going to leave this place, and man, life's going to hit us in the mouth sometimes. There will be difficult times when we make it a habit of gathering consistently with the body. It helps us walk in that unwavering faith in him who is faithful. So reason number one, why should we gather consistently? Why is this investment so important for us? Uh, reason number one, because the Bible clearly tells us to. Because God has given us his word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul's writing to, to his, his young protege, Timothy, and he tells him that all Scripture, all of it, is breathed out by God, and it is profitable 
for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man or the woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. God has given us His Word that we might be mature and equipped and complete, that we might have a source of correction and reproof and teaching and training in our lives. And here within that word that was breathed out by God for us, he reminds us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. In the 1980s, the average church attender uh, would be at church gathering a little more than three times per month. So you kind of average it out. It was roughly three times a month. They were going to be there uh, gathered with the body. It was a consistent part of their life. But you know that for modern day Americans in the church, it's slightly below two times a month. That for whatever reason, um, believers, even though the word commands us to be a part of the local church and to gather consistently, not forsake the assembling of ourselves, uh, we've decided that it's not important. Maybe you're that person and you've kind of grown weary with it. Maybe you're like me out on that fish and you've been casting that fishing pole over and over and over and wondering, you know, is this really going to be productive for me? Would you listen to the words of your heavenly Father who loves you? Who desires for you to walk in fullness and abundance and see that God's desire for his church is that we would gather consistently to encourage one another, to build one another up, to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And would you just make this a priority in your life this year, believing God that this will bear fruit in your life. Now, you may not see it, and I'll be honest with you, um, this is not a terribly popular uh, idea in our culture because we kind of like, well, we're individualistic, aren't we? Isn't that kind of the way that culture tells you that you, you don't really need to listen to anyone else? You kind of do your own thing. We don't like established religion, organized religion. I just kind of like to seek God on my own. Again, I would just want to call you back to the fact that the God of the universe, who knows you better than you know yourself, who cares for you enough and to lay down his life that you might find life in him. He has called you to this practice, to be repeated and to not be forsaken uh, week after week. Again, please go on vacation. Please stay home uh, when you're sick. Enjoy your life, but make this an ongoing and repeated part of your life that you would uh, gather consistently with the body. Now, the, the second reason the first is that God has called us to this, and so we just to submit to Him, right? That's probably all the reason that we need, uh, but we're given more here in this text in particular. Um, the, the first reason is because the Bible tells us to, but in verse 23, we're called to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. You know, the expectation here is that as we go throughout our lives as believers— we will be tempted to waver in our faith in Jesus Christ. You know, we don't live in a culture any longer that affirms everything that God affirms, right? As a matter of fact, as you leave this place, the current of culture is not going to push you toward Christ, but really it's going to pull you away from Him. There will be temptation to waver, to, to compromise, to get distracted from the things that really matter. And this calling to not forsake the gathering of ourselves or the assembling of ourselves is a calling to not waver, that we might be reminded here. So here's what it looks like. We gather here to hear the word preached over us, to be reminded of the gospel and of what God desires for us, to be reminded of the nature and the character of God, of his holiness, of his righteousness, of his love for us as individuals. So we gather here to hear the word preached. We gather here to celebrate baptism, to be reminded that we too have entered the baptismal waters where we made this declaration that we died to the person that we once were. There's no longer, no, there's no condemnation in Christ, for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. As a matter of fact, um, we have been raised to walk up in new lives as sons and daughters of God. We're no longer bound by the things that once bound us, but we are free in Christ Jesus to live lives that would be pleasing to him. So we hear the word preached and we celebrate baptism together. We've got one coming up, by the way. Um, we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We're reminded of the body of Jesus Christ that was offered up for us on the cross. 
of the suffering that he endured, the suffering that we deserve that Jesus took on for us. We're reminded of the blood that was shed. And, and the cross shouts throughout all of eternity of the love of Jesus Christ for us. We'll be tempted to waver. We'll be tempted to lose sight of the gospel. We'll be tempted to do what's easy, to fall into that which is comfortable. But through these ordinances and through the preaching of the word, we're reminded that Jesus said, Father, not my will but yours be done. And he went to the cross for us that we might find life. And rather than doing what feels comfortable to us and settling into a routine that's easy, we continue to obey Jesus Christ, giving up our lives for other people, serving and offering ourselves in service to God. The final thing that we do as we gather here is we use our gifts to build one another up. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus it says that he gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So interestingly enough, uh, the, the prophets weren't necessarily the ones who were going to do all of the work that would mature the whole body. Um, the evangelists didn't have that. The apostles didn't have that. But rather, uh, those men were called to equip all of the saints, that's you if you were in Christ Jesus, for the work of ministry. And here's why we all invest ourselves in ministry. For the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we might be matured and complete. Everybody comes here on a Sunday or when we gather for worship to utilize their gifts in service to the body. There's a group of people that gathers here really early uh, every Sunday morning. Uh, there's people that have been here uh, before uh, most of us have even uh, decided to wake up. And there are people who clean. And people who have been studying and preparing to teach. There are people who take care of the grounds outside of this facility. Men and women who are going to be in the nursery with our kids. Those who run and, and lead uh, technology and lead us in worship. There are people who have been praying for you before, uh, again, before you even woke up this morning. And they're praying that God would move and work in your heart. There are people here who connect with other people and they speak words of encouragement. I believe that God has prophetic words for us to speak to one another, words of encouragement and, and knowledge and scripture. This body has been given all of these members and we're to utilize our gifts to build up one another that we might be mature and complete. So we gather consistently. Because God tells us to, first and foremost. Second, so that we might continue to hope without wavering. The third reason that we gather here consistently is so that we might spur one another on toward love and good works. Can I tell you something that's not terribly popular? Um, what my hope is, is that when you gather here with the body on Sunday morning, man, I hope that the songs resonate with you and you worship Jesus Christ with us. I hope that the sermon hits home and you're like, mm, he read my mail. Yes, like I, I hope that that's the case. Um, I really hope that you leave here feeling loved and valued and cared for. I really do. But you know what I hope for you even more than those things? Is that you leave here having poured yourself out in worship to Jesus Christ this weekly worship gathering isn't about me, and it's not about you, and it's not, not about any other person other than Jesus. We gather here to offer him his due, to give ourselves to him in worship, to, to surrender our lives before him, to submit ourselves to his word. Like this gathering isn't ultimately about us, but it's about him. And so what I hope for those of you who uh, like to get up early, you know, the early risers, we all brag. I'm one of them. I'm like, yeah, I got up at 5 a.m. this morning, you know, spent time in the Word. Like, if you're an early riser kind of person, I would just challenge you uh, very specifically that you would make it a point to be at, at church, at this gathering, early every single week. 
And some of you are, are, are doing this, and you, you get here early, and you serve in the various capacities. I mean, somebody made the coffee that I've been drinking this morning, you know. Uh, but you might just get here early uh, with a, a mind to connect with other people, that you would see someone, that you might have an opportunity to, uh, to pray for them uh, before church even starts. Or you see someone who needs a word of encouragement, and you would just offer yourself in service to them. Listen, the, the ways to serve in this body are not limited to the official positions and roles that the, the church staff have laid out for us. But rather, we come here to serve this body, to think, how can I spur someone, one, someone else on toward love and good works? Maybe you come, and God's laid on your heart, and like, hey, I have extra money. God, who, who needs it this week? Would you steer me to somebody, bring someone into my path that needs this extra money that you've given me that I might be able to help them? Now, if you're uh, not an early bird, you're not that guy, right? You like to sleep in. Uh, maybe you're one of the people that shows up late. Here would be my admonition to you. You get, get to church on time best you can, right? It makes everything flow easier for everybody if, if we get here on time. Um, but then you stay afterward and you connect with people who are here and maybe you see a new family and you take them to lunch and you learn about their story and it's an opportunity for you to, to encourage them to be a part of this body or wherever God might lead them. You encourage them in their walk or you, you stick around and you, you, you speak to people who don't seem to know other people or you offer those same words of encouragement or have that money in your pocket that you would see that what we do here isn't ultimately about us that what we do here is we gather to worship Jesus Christ and to offer ourselves in service to him as we serve one another. So we gather because the Bible tells us to, so that we might continue to hope without wavering. And we gather that we might spur one another on toward love and good works. I will tell you right now, there are people in this body who are discouraged today. And neither I nor our staff, nor our elders. Uh, listen, we, we can't account for everybody, but God has given this body to one another to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Worship is not something that we consume, but rather it's something that we offer. So as you show up here this week, or each week, I encourage you to be ready to spur one another on. Now, the final reason that we would gather consistently as a body, and we would just make this a pattern for our lives, mark it off on our calendars, it's blacked out, that's, that's worship time to the Lord. Because the Bible tells us to, so that we might hope without wavering, so that we might spur one another on toward love and good works. And the final piece here, because the day is drawing near. As we look back to this passage in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 23, he said, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another, uh, stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting the meet, meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. With each passing day, we're one day closer to the return of Jesus Christ. And with each passing day, we need one another all the more. If you look around you, you know that things are getting more difficult for us in our faith. Now, we're not persecuted like, like some places, right? It's, we have the freedom to gather here. Uh, we can preach the word without fear, but it's getting more difficult to live as a believer. We've been warned in the Scriptures, 1 Peter 5, 8, warned to be sober-minded and to be watchful because our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, that we have an enemy who's ro roaming to and fro seeking the one that he might devour and the closer we get, the more difficult things are going to grow for us. As that day draws near, we're going to need one another even more. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, the Apostle Paul tells them to be very careful how they walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Church, I want to remind you that days are evil and we have an enemy. And as the days draw near... We need to encourage one another more and more. This becomes even more important for us. Several years ago, I was sitting at my, my parents' house, 
And I think we'd been doing some landscaping work, and we were kind of sitting outside where my parents have some flower beds, and, I, and I'm just sitting there. It's, it's a nice day. You know, we'd finished what we were doing. It was sunny and, you know, nice and cool, uh, and it, it was just a, a really nice time, like sitting out and talk, sing, talking and, and relaxing. It was, it was a good day, and everything was fine until I look over at one point, and I see right below where my mom is sitting, like at her feet, there is a snake slithering like right beneath her. And of course, like you, you see that, um, you know, my body does that, that dump of adrenaline and I'm like, oh my gosh, like what are we going to do? I'm, I'm scared of the snake, but I can't show her that because I'm a dude and I don't want to, you know, humiliate myself. And so I decide that with the calmest possible voice, I'm just going to tell her, hey mom, you need to get up. But I can't, I, you know, I, like it's, it's hitting me and I'm starting to feel like shaky, you know. And so I'm like, mom, you need to get up. And she immediately knows. I'm her child, you know. She can tell something's going wrong. And so rather than the really careful, like I'm just going to step away kind of thing, my mom screams and jumps up from where she is and like runs, thankfully, in the correct direction um, and didn't get bit by the snake. It turns out it was harmless. But, you know, you see a snake and you think uh, something terrible is going to happen because they're awful, Right. Many of us, as we, as we go throughout our lives in the church, it's kind of like me and my parents. It's like, oh man, it's beautiful out here. And it's sunny. Wind's blowing. It's a great day. And we're just kicked back, relaxing, unaware that there's danger all around. If we, if we live our lives as if everything is perfect and everything is always going to be good and we're never going to be challenged, we're never going to have seasons of doubt or difficulty, or suffering, or persecution, if we just go through life like having no idea of the danger that's lurking all around us, we're going to get devoured. Why did Paul write that to the church at Ephesus? Why did Peter pen those words that we need to be sober-minded and watchful because we have an enemy? They wrote them because they're true. And to warn the church that it's really easy for us, in particular, it's easy for us as Americans who enjoy such extraordinary prosperity to lose sight of the fact that we have an enemy who's roaming to and fro and seeking the one that he can devour. Even more as the day draws near, we gather here to consistently to spur one another on toward love and good deeds to help the one who might be tempted to waver. Today, I'm going to invite you to begin sowing this discipline into your life. To make it a point in your life, devoting yourself daily to Jesus Christ and gathering, gathering consistently with this body, that it might bear fruit in your life and ultimately uh, into the future of your family. That it might bear fruit not just in you, but even in those who are around you. That as God continues to walk with you and work in you, that he might work through you in this community. And we're, we're a hopeful people. What we all have are only so many seeds to scatter. Our time, our talent, our treasure, it's limited. But here's the beauty of sowing. When you take those few seeds of your time, treasure, and talents that God has given you and you sow them into the field, you know what happens? They produce a harvest that's greater than what's been sown. Those farmers during the Dust Bowl era, they sold what little bit, or they sowed what little bit they had left. And they reaped a har harvest that was 30, 60, or even 100 times more than what they'd sown. What they sowed into their life bore more fruit than they probably could have imagined or hoped for. And it's my prayer for us as disciples of Jesus Christ, as we gather around these six practices and give our lives to these things, that God would bear fruit in us and through us that is beyond what we can even imagine. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus God, we're thankful that you're a good father who teaches us and has instructed us, that you did breathe out the words of Scripture, that we might be equipped and trained, that we might be able to, to learn and grow in our knowledge of you and how to follow you as disciples. Lord, I pray that these things, devoting ourselves daily and gathering consistently, would just be the, the places 
where we choose to invest day after day and week after week following after Jesus. God, may this not be some legalistic, empty endeavor, but may it be a pursuit of you where we gather here to offer you worship. And God, I do pray that this church would build one another up, that we might be strengthened and unwavering, that we might be rich in good works, and that you may bear much fruit in our lives and through our lives. Lord, we pray this in the powerful and the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.